Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope you're doing really well in this moment in time. And that no matter where you are or when you are, no matter what air you are breathing, no matter what soil your feet touch upon, from day to day, I hope that you are able to ask yourself one simple question, and this is it. Am I able to give myself as much leeway as I give to others? Am I able to give myself as much leeway as I give to other people? That's it. It's a very simple question. Introduction's done. I'm just kidding. (laughs) All right, I better explain this, right? So I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about um, how empaths tend to feel what other people feel. And so we're aware of what other people are going through. So we give them a lot of leeway. We give them a lot of compassion. We give them a lot of you know, excuses a lot of times. Women do this a lot. I've noticed. I think men can do this too, though. So I don't want to single anyone out, out on you know, based on gender or whatever. But a lot of us will kind of, I don't know, I, I want to say we kind of like tend to make ourselves a doormat sometimes, right? And I know I have in the past, no longer, I don't do it anymore, but I know that I used to do this and I'm going to ask you about this. I do give yourself as much leeway as you give other people. Do you give yourself as much compassion as you give other people? So I don't know. It's like if somebody messes up in life and they screw up. Do you go, well, maybe he was having an off day. Maybe she wasn't on top of her game or maybe she slipped up or maybe he wasn't aware. But if you do the same thing, other people go, it's totally your fault. You did this thing, whatever, whatever the thing is. I have nothing in my mind when I say this, but I I just start thinking about like, you know, how many times have people not given me the benefit of the doubt. How many times have they not used compassion or compassionate wisdom in dealing with something I've said or done? You know, and how many times could I have used it? How, how many times could I have used the benefit of the doubt? You know, like maybe Someone said, well, you said this thing and we don't really know what you mean. Can you possibly explain it? Because it doesn't sound like normally you, right? Has anyone ever done that to you? Probably not, right? And yet how many times have you done this for other people in your mind? Well, maybe, you know, the thing he said was a little abusive. But he's not an abuser, right? (laughs) Think about it. Think about it. You know, or maybe, well, you know, he was abused as a child. So, you know, that's why I'm just going to have more love and more compassion for him. And my loving nature and my compassion, that's going to make him a better person, right? Okay, fuck that. Okay, (laughs) I'm telling you, just screw that right now. Okay, because that's just, 
You don't need to give other people that kind of leeway. Sure, have compassion for them at a distance. Kick them out, boot them out. You don't need abusers in your life. Oh, but Elena, how are they, how are they going to learn how not to be abusive unless they're around non-abusive people? No, they're there to abuse you. Get them out of your life, right? You don't need that. You don't deserve it. You deserve better. You deserve the amount of compassion that you give to others. You need to give that to yourself, right? So if you're ever in a situation where you are being abused or you're being used, maybe you're not being abused, right? Maybe no one's punching you, right? But maybe, maybe they're verbally saying stuff that's rude or abusive. You know, I have a friend who I, I, uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but he's a good friend and we were only friends, nothing more. And one day he called me and he said that, um, he might want to, might want to fly down to South America and actually start dating me. He's like, you know, we've been good friends for years and maybe you're my one, you know? And now I know he's not my one. I've had dreams about my twin flame. I've had uh, visions of my twin flame. And I telepath with my twin flame. I've never met him in person. I've never even met him. He's never even texted or written or anything. I don't know him yet. I'll let you guys know the minute I do. But I know who he is, right? For the most part, I, I know his his face. I've dreamt of him. So my friend who says this to me, maybe I'll come down and have you know, a relationship with you because I really like you. You're really cool and you're just so positive and we could be really great together. And then he... I asked something and I don't remember, and I guess I didn't know the answer to some question. And he, and I asked him a question. And he goes, of course not. You stupid old cow. That's what he called me a stupid old cow. And I'm like, excuse me now. Okay. Granted he is from Bristol. And if, <laughs> if any of you are listening from England, you're, you're going to laugh at that. But, <laughs> and I know a lot of people from Bristol, so I'm not singling anyone out. When I said, but I, it was in that moment and I just was like, you know what? I really love this guy, but not enough to have a relationship with someone who's going to make me feel like shit about myself, about anything for any reason ever, (laughs) you know, now I have a pretty tough skin overall, you know, it's cool. But I mean, I just started thinking, and then he said some, you know, he said a couple other things in that one conversation and made me realize, you know, he was not trying to be abusive. It's just the, the rough culture there from his rough, rough neighborhood where he came from. Like he told me growing up, he had to sneak into people's houses and as he put it, Nick stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and then sell it at the pawn shop in order to eat. Cause his mom, uh, didn't have money and she was, I think, I don't know, boozed up or something. I don't know. Couldn't, um, be bothered to work or provide for him so he had to nick stuff so I mean he grew up in a rough neighborhood you know and that's okay you know but I remember in that moment thinking wow you know what I'm giving myself more I give him compassion for his situation sure but I do deserve not to be treated like that he was just kidding he was laughing and joking and among his friends that's fine that's funny it's whatever but for me it wasn't it wasn't didn't sit right didn't feel good didn't feel good. <laughs> Hate being called old. I'm not stupid, very intelligent. And cow just, I mean, is that a comment on my weight? Are cows stupid? I don't understand. You know, what would it, maybe I'm stupid. No, I'm just kidding. No, I know I'm smart and I know who I am and I know that I'm a loving, beautiful, compassionate, intelligent person and I have a lot to offer the right person, right? But I remember thinking, I need more. I need to be treated better. I mean, it wasn't enough to have stuff in common. It wasn't enough to have um, the love, the friendship love there. I, I deserve to be treated really well. And I deserve respect. Constantly. Right? Because, you know, when I'm in a relationship in the future, I know I'm going to give my partner respect. Even in the middle of a fight, I don't, I don't call people names. You know, I, I don't, I don't do that. And, and I expect not to be called names, right? Um, I mean, I will walk away. 
from somebody who calls me names like that makes me not feel very good, right? But I know in my past, I've given people more leeway. I've given them more benefit of the doubt than they actually freaking deserve. And I'm sure most of you listening have too. You know, um, there's a, there's a lot of sayings in the United States about this kind of thing, you know, like, um, in for a penny in for a pound, I think is something came from England actually, <laughs> you know, but, uh, or give them an inch. They'll take a mile. That's what we say in the United States. You give someone that, you know, that inch leeway, they're going to take a mile. You know, you give them just a little bit of a wedge. You know, they get their foot in the door. Now they're moving in. That's another kind of, it's not an expression, but it's kind of like, don't let him get his foot in the door. (laughs) Don't let him get a foothold. Don't, Don't let him get a stronghold in your life. Have you ever heard warnings like that about somebody who you're giving too much leeway to? There's a reason why we have all these weird, funny sayings. Because it's true, you know, um, you have to give people love and compassion, but you don't need to give them so much that you forget to have love and compassion for yourself. Don't ever give somebody else more benefit of the doubt than you give yourself. Don't give somebody else more leeway than you give yourself. that's pretty much the message, you know, um, trying to think of another way to put it so that I could be understood more. Um, I can't even remember what brought this on. Honestly, I can't remember what brought this on, but I was thinking about it this morning and I'm like, you know, like, you know, guys that I've dated that just ended up being, (laughs) You know, they look like studs, but end up duds. <laughs> yeah. People that, you know, they, oh yeah, they look like they got everything going on. And then it turns out they're just shysters or like they should never have been in my life, let alone my children's life, lives. You know, it, it's, I've had some really bad dating experiences that really went wrong. And the reason why... I was even with them longer than I ought to have been is because I did give them the benefit of the doubt. I did give them leeway. I did give them more than they deserved. More love, more compassion, more of my time and attention, more my money in some cases. And they didn't really deserve that, right? Not all the men anyway. I have a couple exes that are actually really wonderful people that I love. I'm still friends with, you know, and that, and I don't mean them, you know, but, but I mean like narcissists, sociopaths that I've met. Um, I remember years and years ago, I, I saw on the cover of some magazine, it said, did you know that, up that it's like close to 10% of the American society are sociopaths. That means like, or is it 10% or is it one in 10? I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah, they said one in 10%. I mean, one in 10. Yeah, I guess that is 10%, right? <laughs> Math. <laughs> ah, it's hard for me to walk and talk, chew gum at the same time. <laughs> it's hard for me to record a podcast and do math at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, but so one in 10 people are, are a psycho or a, a sociopath and said, do you, who in your life is a sociopath? I'm like, holy crap, scared the crap out of me. And now that I know what that is and I've studied it now, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I know how to eliminate those people from my life. I don't need to continuously know and or not know who it is and ooh and be scared, you know. So I hope that some of the things I've told you guys, especially last year, I think last February I did a series on this stuff. And I might have to again, you know, go over the traits of sociopathology <laughs> because it's uh really worth knowing about. 
someone told me once, think about this for a minute. If you, if you know, uh, nine people and none of them are sociopath, I guess you are the sociopath. I'm like, Oh my God, that's terrible. Cause he said one in 10, like, that's not true. I'm not a sociopath, <laughs> but it's scary, right? To think about like, you know, that there's that many people and you know, now psychopaths are easy to spot because they just don't give a flying fig at all. And they're crazy from the get go. So it's easy to avoid these people, right? But sociopaths are a little bit more, they fit in more, they fit in, you know, and narcissists too, they fit in and, you know, a little bit more. So it's, they blend in and then you're just like, okay, well, oh, well, she's a little vain. Well, he is a little full of himself, isn't he? Wow. Look, she's, she's a little bit arrogant, huh? He thinks he's, he's, he's the bee's knees. (laughs) No one says that anymore. He's a cat's pajamas. (laughs) Nah, I love all those crazy old sayings. <laughs> it's like before my grandma's time, you know, it was like so long ago, <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. I just, you have to be aware and you have to be aware of what you're giving, you know, like when we sit in a, a position where We're giving, 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 and the people around you are just taking. Eventually, you get to a point where you just feel like you can't give anymore. You're not being replenished. Your cup is not being filled up. You're just spilling everything you have out onto people that don't deserve it, you know? And if you're doing that, just stop. Just stop. Just cut them off easy to do during social isolation unless it's like your roommate or your husband or something but if someone you don't live with then you don't really have to live with them when the coronavirus pandemic is over you know it's like you don't have to oh sorry just my life I, I yeah whatever you don't need to owe people an explanation if they don't treat you well if you keep giving someone the benefit of the doubt and they just keep disappointing you it's time Time to call it, baby. Just, it's done. It's over. It's dead. Don't beat that dead horse. Just let it be. (laughs) Throw dirt on it and move on. (laughs) So that was my, pretty much my message. I hope you guys, I don't know. I just, it's like this morning, I I, I was thinking about it. I was like, God, think of all the times I did that. And I just wasted my time, wasted my time on people and my energy. And if you're wasting your time and energy on someone like that, it's just, you know, they're just taking, I don't know, whoever needed to hear this message, you've heard it. (laughs) Uh, I mean, give yourself at least as much, if not more compassion and more leeway than you give to other people. You know, if you're not going to excuse your behavior, why are you excusing anybody else's behavior? You know, don't, don't hold yourself in a different standard than you hold others. Don't, you know, like, and don't expect yourself to be absolutely 100% perfect. Don't expect other people to be this is actually, you know, I just started to remember, this is another thing. Like I remember, okay. So I was going through, I was scrolling through, um, some pictures and I've seen people that were, um, saying, look at me, I don't have uh, makeup on and I'm okay with that. You know, and I think in uh, where we're going to be in a society is where we are okay with everybody. We're okay with ourselves, with who we are. We're okay with other people, with who they are. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in a world where if you just leave the house without makeup, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? You didn't get up on time. You didn't, whatever, you know, like there's, there's a reason why. And then people kind of look at you like, Ooh, it's very weird. Now looking back, it's like weird. I barely wear makeup. I I wear makeup like, I don't know, like since the coronavirus, like maybe once every six weeks, I'll 
just for fun, put makeup on. So I walk in the bathroom, look in the mirror, and I'm like, oh, wow, look, I'm made up. It's kind of fun. <laughs> but I usually don't wear makeup. I usually don't. I just, you know, why? Why put chemicals on my face? I don't need it. But, um, so I love that people are like, hey, this is me. I'm here. I'm busting the basic idea of what beauty is. I'm showing you my face without makeup. Sure. You know, like there's this one woman, I don't remember her name, but she, she does this every three or four days. She'll like say, hi, it's me again. And she's like got the most adorable personality and she's an older woman. She's in her sixties and maybe even older. I, I'm not really sure. She doesn't look it, but I don't know. Hope to God she's not in her fifties. I just said that, but <laughs> But she's like, hi, I'm here to bust people's paradigms with how I look, you know. And then I have um, a, a couple other people that I follow. And they're um, like, there's one woman who is overweight. And she's like pretty significantly overweight. And she like um, just wears really sexy, beautiful clothes and she is kind of, um, just performing. She just does different things, random things. And again, she's another one of these people who decided to come to the planet to bust people's paradigms about what's beautiful or what people should or shouldn't be doing. You know, Oh, that's not proper for, you know, a woman of her age or a woman of her weight or a woman of her, whatever the hell, you know? And so there's a lot of people like that. And I'm really grateful, you know, because when it comes right down to it, like we're so programmed to judge people if they don't look like they come off the cover of Vogue, which is stupid, right? Media. That's, that's another, so this is another part of it. Like, and I know I've got that shallow part of that little, like, you know, critical crap going on in my head. That's just programming from my childhood from, you know, growing up you know, in a world where you have to be perfect. (laughs) If you're, if you're fatter than Twiggy, which is, (laughs) you know, Twiggy was literally like a fucking twig, you know, (laughs) if you're fatter than Twiggy, then what's wrong with you? (laughs) You know, and that's how everyone started getting into that bulimia thing and, you know, anorexia and all that crap, you know, like I, I remember thinking, um, just a couple days ago, I was looking at some dresses on wish.com. I was using the wish app, which I freaking love. I, I I'm, I'm like window shopping. So I have like all these lists now. So I have like the, the, um, if I ever live in a fabulous beach house dress dresses, right? I think it's like called fabulous beach house clothing is one of my lists. And so I'll go through all these beautiful summer dresses. Now I live in a place where it's really cold. I will never wear this here. Unless I wear like big heavy sweaters over these fabulous little thin little almost practically see-through dresses. <laughs> There's dresses that are like maxi dresses that go down like they go down my ankles, right? It, but it, but I have like this idea of what I want to you know where I want to be and what I want to wear and you know. But I, I'm never gonna buy these because I'm not gonna wear them where I live. It's stupid. But I have so I have a list. So I make a list of these fabulous whatever. And, um, and I was like going through people's comments and I was going through their, uh, pictures, you know, and like, you know, one woman's like, I had to order a five XL, which that sounds freaking enormous, right? But it's not that much bigger than like a, maybe a two XL in the U S right. You know, not even because Chinese, um, sizes are smaller. These are Asian sizes. And the company was from China that's making this dress. So, and like, it's like, seriously, like, you know, like a a large would like, you know, it's just a large there is like an extra small in the U S you know, it's like ridiculous. So they always say like two or three sizes, you know, go up two or three sizes. Right. So, um, this lady is, um, you know, she had to order like the biggest possible size and she was a little bit overweight and, and, um, not, she was overweight. She was maybe, I don't know, 30 or 40 pounds or something overweight. I would say if I had to guess. Right. And I remember thinking, 
oh, she looks so cute and she's so brave that she, you know, and anyone, no matter who they are, are brave that they could take a picture, put it on Wish for all the world to see. You know, I just think it's super brave, no matter who you are, right? You know, and it's like, I'm scrolling through, here's, you know, a really, really skinny person who said they had, they ordered a medium and it was a little bit big on them. And I'm like, oh, how adorable, right? This really tiny person. And then this other woman, you know, and I'm thinking how brave though, every single one of these women are absolutely brave, like modeling the dress. And then there's the people that are shy and they'll take a picture of their dress, like laying on the bed or laying on their couch. And I'm like, yeah, that's like, I think I would want to model it so other people could get a feel for how the fabric hangs on my body type for, you know, like maybe their body type is the same as me and they would like to know. But then I think, God, you know, I, I, it's like, you have to be so brave to do that. No matter what you look like, where you're really skinny or really you know, heavy or somewhere in the middle. Most people are somewhere on the spectrum, obviously. So I was just thinking, you know, how I was like, oh, she's so cute. Look how good she looks or wow, good for her. Like, I wish I could, you know, like I'll like it because it's helpful because there's, is this helpful or not helpful? So I'll like, like it. And then I, I wish I could add a comment sometimes like, you know, you're so brave and you look amazing. Like it's, it's brave to do this, to, to put yourself out there. Right. And, and I'm like, oh, she looks so cute in that. And then I start thinking, you know, if I imagine myself in that dress, I think, well, maybe my stomach doesn't look very big. You know, it looks a little bit too big today, or maybe I don't look, maybe I'm too bloated. Like if I wore that, I would be, I would be absolutely embarrassed to wear that in public. But then when I see these women and I think they look cute and then I don't think anything of it. Why am I giving them more leeway than I give myself? That's, that's kind of one thing that came to my mind. And the other thing about the abusers, that, that was like there in my mind first. But then I thought, even with the little insignificant things like that, you know, like I don't look at other people and go, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed for her because look at her. I don't do that. I did when I was 18 and I don't do it anymore. I just think, oh, she looks so cute. And then I start realizing, you know, I have been looking at the world with a distorted view about everything, you know, like why does any of that matter? Like, like the looks, the, 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 you know, the body has to be all perfect. And I was an obsessive bodybuilder for a while, a long time ago when I was young, 19, maybe 19 through maybe 23, something like that. I was, man, I was hitting the gym all the time. I was so like, uh, I was really obsessive. I had to, you know, eat perfect, do perfect, be perfect. And then I just was always on myself. I was always judging myself. And then I was always judging other people because I was always judging myself. See, cause you kind of do that, you know, and sometimes people have shown me compassion. Oh, you look good. So what? Well, my stomach's sticking out a little bit today. So what? You're still cute. It doesn't matter. So my friend Sarah used to always say to me, gosh, you're so cute. It doesn't matter. No one's looking at your stomach anyway, you know? And then, and then I had another friend who told me, she says, look at me. I think I got fat when I went to Oregon, right? She says, I drank this, this beer all the time. I was with this beer was blue, blueberry, no blackberry beer. It was so good. And then they had strawberry beer. Oh my God. All these, all these artisanal beers. I drank so much beer. I'm so fat. What do you think? And she was a stripper. So it's hilarious. She's she's a stripper. So she whips off her shirt. She has no bra on. And and I was just like, what the hell are you doing right now? She's like, honestly, just look at my body. Cause this is how I make my living. I need to know. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? (laughs) Why are you doing this? And she says, well, I mean, look, do I look fat? I'm like, just to be honest with you, I'm not looking at your stomach right now. <laughs> and if a man's going to look at your stomach over those fabulous breasts, then there's no way in hell. They're like, you know what I mean? Like, don't even give them your, you know, any attention. Because <laughs> you're beautiful. You're beautiful. It doesn't matter. And then I think, you know, as I think about these incidences, like the body, it's almost like a, I don't know what it is. It's just, we need to accept and love our bodies, right? From head to toe every part of our body for every possible in every possible way we can 
you know, like give ourselves love and compassion. Like, are we a little bit overweight? Maybe we are. Are we a little bit underweight? Maybe we are. Are we actually totally okay? But we just think in our minds that we're too skinny or we think in our minds we're too fat or we think in our our minds we're too out of shape. And maybe we are, maybe we're not. But Sasha, who I'm starting to become friends with, I think, uh, she is a listener on the show and I know she's going to hear this. So hi, Sasha. And we've been talking for days over the weekend and she's asked me a couple questions that really kind of helped formulate, you know, tonight's little chat. (laughs) And she said, do you, have you ever done the mirror exercise? I'm like, what do you mean by the mirror exercise? Like I'm mirroring my twin flame all the time, you know, and you know, I don't know. I, and then I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and she says, have you ever just like stood naked in front of, of a mirror and told every part of your body that you like it, look at your body. And, and I'm like, Oh God, I can't look in the mirror anymore. I can't be naked in front of the mirror anymore. My twin flame sees my body through my eyes. I feel him. And then he makes comments. It's like, I don't want him to look at me naked right now. Right. We never met each other, but he, like I'm tasting his food. He's seen my body through my eyes. When I look in the mirror, it's freaky. This stuff is freaky. So I'm like, I don't, I don't look in the mirror anymore. Cause I don't want him to see me. <laughs> Cause it's embarrassing. It's like, you have to know me first, you know, wine me, dine me before you could 69 me. Right. <laughs> like come on you know freaking text me once you know before you see me naked come on stop looking at me through my eyes <laughs> he's never mean by the way he's very sweet he's super super sweet when i have when like i'll be like thinking okay i feel like he might be asleep all right and i'll go you know like do whatever if i'm in the shower and i hop out of the shower and i'm like in front of the mirror and i think oh okay maybe he's asleep because i don't feel him i don't hear and all of a sudden I'll, he'll say something it's like, oh my God, quit looking at me through my eyes in my mirror. It's freaky anyway. But yeah, and, and I have done that, but maybe not to the extent of which she meant, right? And I start, but I do in my mind's eye. <laughs> I can't see me through my mind's eye. Okay, maybe he can. But I don't know how far this twin flame thing, I don't know the extent of it. <laughs> I'm learning more and more as we go along into this though. But I do love my body and I, and I, and I do tell my body that I love it, but I do still criticize myself. I do still like, well, you know, we need to do this. We need to do that. And even I just said that I touched my own stomach. It's like, yeah, okay. Well, you know, (laughs) I have a lot of water weight that I carry in my stomach in my midsection lately. And, um, some days I just release all the water weight and I'm thin and it's like, oh, okay. It was just water. I'm fine. You know, and I don't know if it's emotional or if it's just, you know, we're pulling in so much light into our bodies lately and it takes us a long time to absorb the energy of the light, to release it out into the world. Some of us are literally light workers, meaning that we're light holders and we're holding the light in each individual cell. We're holding the light. And so we're looking pretty big there for a few days, you know, like maybe our clothes are a little snug and then we let go of the light and we're fine. And we release the water weight. We need to hold the water in our bodies in order to hold the energy, the high vibrational energy of the light. So it doesn't burn out our nervous system. Now I'm not the only person who said this. I I don't remember who was saying it. I want to say possibly a Luna Ash said this a couple years ago there. I've heard this from two or three different people, but I know that God has said this through me several times. Cause I'm like, why do I have to look so freaking bloated? I look huge, you know? And then I have days where I look great. I'm like, damn, look at me. I look pretty nice, you know? And then, but I judge myself based on what water weight I'm holding. It's so dumb. But then when I see other people who look like they're holding water, I go, Oh, I like that outfit on her. She looks cute. Like, I don't even consider that. And then like, and then, then I'll say that and then I'll think, well, why does she look cute? And then, and I'll go, well, 
I don't know. I just have so much love and compassion for everybody. You know, like I don't, like I could see if somebody is overweight. I, you know, I'm not like ignoring that, but I don't think, oh, what's wrong with her? You know, did she, you know, like, and then I'll go down the, like, I don't go down the line of what I would say for myself. Am I not eating right? Am I not exercising enough? You know, like all the critical crap that I say to myself in my own head, I never do that for other people. You know, like if I see someone's overweight, I think, oh, maybe she has um, this issue or that issue health wise. I'll pray for her. I'll give her love. I'll send her energy. She looks like she's really struggling with that extra weight. Let me give her love. But then for myself, it's like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you, you know, eat better or whatever? Like I'll criticize myself instead of saying, maybe I should give myself love and compassion for, you know, cause I, I do have uh, struggles with the, when I get the extra water weight, it's, it's a big struggle for me. Right. So I don't, but I don't give myself love and compassion. I just think, why am I so overweight? Right. Like I get upset with myself. So that's what I mean by that's another. So there's like multiple levels and layers to this whole giving uh, yourself as much leeway as you give others. And I've been thinking about this for several days, three or four days. Like all these thoughts have kind of congealed into one big talk. So anyway, I just, I want you guys to be aware of, of that. I don't know if this, if I'm just rambling at this point, but you know, like, I don't know. Cause like I I've had a lot of friends who actually were significantly overweight and struggled with it. So, so much, right? Like my friend Amber, she drank a lot. She was an alcoholic, serious, big time, like passing out, not remembering blackout type of alcoholic towards the end of her life, you know? And she just always was a life of the party. One of the coolest people I ever met, loved her dearly my whole life just she was like a second mom to me third fourth mom fifth mom whatever I have so many parents <laughs> my parents can get their shite together like they kept divorcing and remarrying other people and I have a lot of parents but anyway whatever <laughs> fourth mom <laughs> that was that was her you know she was just like she was like an extra mother for me and I loved her very much for that but um I you know it's like I would look at myself in the mirror and I was a little size three Oh, I ate a bagel, so my stomach's sticking out a teeny tiny bit. And then be all like, oh, I'm so fat. I need to work out more. And then I go to Amber's where she's like 10 pounds extra water weight because she's on her period or something. And I just be like, no, you look cute. Like, I don't, I gave her so much love and so much compassion. And I didn't give it for myself. That's what I mean. And, and it's from the very shallow thing like that when none of that really flocking matters because in the end we're all just these big beautiful bright souls we're just energy we're energetic forms inhabiting a weird little physical body you know compared and I don't care if you're 10 feet tall your soul is like a hundred feet tall so when I say weird little bodies compared to what you really truly are you know it's really strange you know, and we spend so much time trying to be perfect physically, you know, or we don't. And then, but then we just beat ourselves up for not being physically perfect, you know, or, and if that's not an issue for you, awesome. I'm so glad it's not because it shouldn't be. And maybe you're healthy in that way. And I'm not, I don't know. I'm still working on it. Anyway, I'm working on myself as you guys are working on yourselves. And, you know, so part of my introductions on the show is just to help you work through some of it. Maybe I'm going to give you insight through my own insight. You know, maybe I'll give you insight through my own ignorance. Sometimes you never know, but I, but I've decided consciously over the weekend to give myself as much leeway as I give others and as much compassion as I give others. And to stop giving people leeway and compassion when they don't deserve it. You know, which I made that decision a while ago. I mean, I've been single for like years now because I, it's just, I don't want to settle for less. I can't. My standards have gotten very high, not impossible, but high, you know, it's just, I've met 
people, so many people, like practically they're saying to me, I got eyes, you got eyes, let's get married. Dude, we need more in common than eyes. (laughs) I've had so many stupid conversations with men, like their standards are impossibly low. Like you've got eyes, I've got eyes, let's get married. I'm just kidding. No one ever said that to me. It's practically that, that, uh, like the bar is really set low there, dude. Like, come on. (laughs) It's not that bad, but I used to, oh, you're a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. Let's get married. Like, no, what? No, I have to have more in common with you than my religion. I need more than that. Am I not a good looking guy? No, it doesn't matter. I need more in common with you. You could look like Brad freaking Pitt, but if I can't have a conversation, that's not what I want. I need intellectual stimulation. I need spiritual connection. I'm a, I found out you guys, do you guys know about this? I said this a few weeks ago. I am a demisexual. Did you guys ever hear this? Um, if you're new to the show and I have a lot new listeners, so welcome aboard by the way, but yeah, when you're a demisexual, you have to have a spiritual and emotional connection and attraction before you can even get naked with somebody, you know, sex is the last thing on your mind until your heart is satisfied. Your mind is satisfied. Your spirit is satisfied. Then you could worry about satisfying the body. I I just don't understand people that just jump into bed right away. I just don't get it. You know, why? Why? You know, I've I've met men here in Ecuador that actually said, well, let's try sex. And if that works out, we'll go for everything else. I'll give you the, you know, the love and the relationship and we'll even get married, but we need to make sure the sex is right first. And and that's just like, ugh, get the hell away from me, dudes. You know, don't even talk to me no more. I'm blocking you, man. It's like, I'm the opposite way. Like, I just can't. It's like, ugh. How many women do you try that with first? Like, how many women say yes to that? Ugh. It gives me a weird willies. It's just like, that's not me, buddy. I'm a, I'm a demisexual. <laughs> um, the, 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 form, the other form of demisexual is if you find demi more sexually attractive. I'm just kidding. That's not, that's not a thing. Although, she is beautiful. And of course, everyone finds her attractive, but, or used to, I don't know. I haven't seen her in years, so who the hell knows what she looks like now, but I bet she's beautiful still. Beautiful inside for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, I was going to mention, I've been sick all weekend long and not with anything that's, it's not coronavirus. Coronavirus? No, it's not that. <laughs> oh my God. Um, my asthma was really, really bad for a few weeks and I was struggling and struggling and struggling. Finally, I just decided to take prednisone again. And so sent my son to the pharmacy and he bought me the president prednisone finally. And on Friday, I was overcome Friday night after actually Friday afternoon after I did that, um, I did my show early. So woohoo, that was awesome. I got it done early and I had the whole weekend and I'm like, yeah, this is exciting. I've got the whole weekend and all of a sudden I was overcome with this absolutely horrible, intense anxiety. And I finally, in fact, I still have a little bit of it now is Monday. And this is like from Friday to Monday, horrible, horrible anxiety. And I don't know if it was from the prednisone, but I have a feeling it was more than that. I feel like this was Ascension symptoms and I'm going to mention it to you guys because I want you to be aware that it's very possible. (laughs) This Ascension symptoms thing. I mean, this is no joke. Um, the Schumann resonances have been high. We're going to talk about this, uh, from Saturday, um, around the world where it was at. It's like hardly anything in, in Italy. Everyone talks about the disclosure. Like when it gets up to 50 people are like, Ooh, but no, when, when I tell you guys about the Schumann resonance, we're talking like 173 Hertz frequency, not 50, you know, it's double and triple what everyone else talks about what, what I'm telling you guys about usually. So 
but it's we were hit on Saturday with four different types of cosmic weather. <laughs> I don't mean like a, a cool wind storm. I mean like freaking three million mile an hour um was a solar flare, I think, a CME hit. We had in the past forty eight hours it hit us at three million miles an hour. We've we were hit with solar winds, we're hit with the normal space radiation. We've been hit by something and then something else. There was another another thing that was kind of newer. I think I mentioned it on Friday, I can't remember now. But anyway, we were hit by four different types of energy. I mean, this this kind of energy, it's like plasma and it's like you don't see it. It's like I don't know how to explain it. I mean, you'd think they'd be like, "Oh, we we're hit by energy. Look, get that slime off my deck or something." You know, like it'd be like the way that it hits us, it seems like it should be just like everything outside should be slimy, like people's rooftops or something should be covered in goo, you know. When when I hear that we've been hit by plasma, it's such a strange thing, but I know that we were just hit by all this energy, like wave after wave after wave this weekend happened. And I think that's what caused my, my anxiety and all day long on like Saturday, my stomach hurt so much and I was having, um, gas and bloating and like air bloating as well as water weight because of all the energy's coming in. And as it comes in, you know, the gamma rays the, um, and, and more, but the gamma rays, they change your DNA when it goes through your body. And, and when you're pulling in so much light and then you get so overweight with the water because you're, you're protecting your cells are protecting yourself, it's protecting your nervous system right? So it's important to drink a lot of water and get a lot of rest. But man, all weekend long, I was having, um, I think I had a headache for a while, like early on, like Friday, maybe. And then for the weekend it wasn't, but starting on Sunday, I had this weak feeling just weak as hell. Like my, my ex used to say weak as a kitten. I always thought that was a weird analogy. Like I feel weak as a kitten. It's like, what? Are kittens weak? Maybe they are. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> then their nails make up for it. <laughs> weak as a kitten. But that's how I felt, like weak. And today, all day long, just absolutely barely able to keep my shit together. Just absolutely weak as hell. Um, I don't know. I just, I've been feeling weird. And today, um, and I had a lot of pressure in the uh, solar plexus chakra like the third chakra like above like around the belly button all the way up through my heart and I had massive like really 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 bad anxiety and then I was able to finally shift and move the energy up and then my heart had such bad anxiety I just felt like just emotionally horrible and I was moving it, I've been moving it, and then now I, now I feel empty. I feel like a hollow, empty capsule or vessel. Like, I just feel empty. And I don't know what that is, but if you guys feel this, then it's the ascension symptoms. But I've moved a bunch of energy. I've been fixing a lot of things. But my twin flame, I think, has been having anxiety. I've been trying to help him. He's been absent for a couple days now. I haven't really felt every now and again, I'll feel him for like a couple of minutes a day where usually I'm there. I'll feel him for hours usually every day. And for the past three days, he's been having a bad time. And today I've been feeling like yesterday and today, very weepy on the verge of crying. And I know that if I watch like, oh my God, if I watch one episode of anything that Ricky Gervais has done, I will probably cry my heart out for two or three hours. That's how I feel. Yeah, I've been watching um, that one where he's a nursing home worker that he's the uh, who's a little slow but very sweet. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. Um, my God, that that show just makes me laugh so hard that I have to like pause it and keep laughing for another ten or fifteen minutes because some things 
are hysterically funny. And then that show makes me cry so hard. And I saw a picture of him in that was one of those sweaters. And I almost cried, like just from the tiniest little thing. So I don't know if you guys are feeling that, if you're kind of feeling like, there's something going on emotionally. My emotions have been all out of whack. Everything's out of whack. Like, and like I said, it could be possibly, you know, maybe just the prep zone. Maybe it's just that, or maybe it's ascension symptoms. That's why I'm mentioning it. So, um, the higher, a lot of insights, higher wisdom coming through as well. Anyway, spaceweather.com. Let's get into it, baby. Solar wind speed has picked up since Friday. It's 404.4 kilometers per second right now. Uh, we are, uh, we do have sunspot number 11. <laughs> There's a nice twin flame number for you. It is a new member or a member of the new solar cycle 25. So that's good news. That's good news. Um, uh, it's a small and faint um, a small and faint sunspot. So it's not, I mean, if it sends out a flare, it'll probably just be a C-class flare, which is the smallest one. But we'll see in the next 24 hours what happens according to spaceweather.com. There's a gorgeous picture of the Aurora Borealis as well as Comet Neowise. Uh, we were hit by CME on 24th of July and, and we were over the weekend as well. The impact was weak and did not spark a full-fledged geomagnetic storm, they said. But it, but it is. It's like a lot. It's a lot of pillars of light. Purple, pink. The sky was green. Absolutely beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. So if you want to check that out, I highly recommend looking at that. Some very, very beautiful things going on. Okay. Uh, there is some noctilucent clouds still going on. Uh, if you want to check that out, there's a little, um, there's a little picture here on spaceweather.com off to the left and it's so bright, beautiful. It's electric blue. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh shit. Here we go. Corona hole. (laughs) We do have a Corona hole facing earth. The solar wind flowing out of the Southern Corona hole. We'll reach Earth on the 28th of July, which is, well, shit, it's right now. So in the next couple hours, we might be getting that. By the time you get this, if you go, well, wow, yesterday I was feeling a little out of it. Yeah, that might be why. That might be why. Let's see where we're at with the, um, where are we at? The neutron counts are high. It's been zero change in the past 48 hours. We're at 9.8%. Of the space age average, that is the cosmic rays that are coming our way, that radiation. It comes just from the cosmos all the time, and now that we have no damn magnetosphere to speak of, it's really affecting us. This is the kind of stuff that causes earthquakes and volcanoes, by the way, in shifts in the earth. Because if it's that big to shift the earth, it's going to affect you too. I know it's affecting me. My bones have been rattling and shaking and inside my body. It feels like, um, it's like someone left a cell phone on vibrate and my, my rib cage has been vibrating for like three days now. Maybe that's what's making me feel so anxious. I don't, maybe we're becoming less dense suddenly. You know what I mean? Like our bodies are because we're more and more in shifting into, the fifth dimension, as we go deeper into the fifth dimension, it's just, this this shit is getting wild, man. (laughs) Did you guys hear, by the way, speaking wild ass shit, the Pentagon has admitted that they have a spacecraft, not of this world, that they recovered from a crash site. They have it. The pentagram, the pentagram, the Pentagon has said this. They admitted it. This is full disclosure. Well, not full disclosure. Full disclosure is when they're going to say, and we've been working with them for dozens of years. We know them. You know, here's General Fripton from the planet Kalamazoo. I don't know. (laughs) Sorry, Kalamazoo is an actual city. I couldn't think of a name of a random planet on the fly there. Okay. (laughs) 
Stick to the script, Elena. I'm just kidding. There's no script. Never a script on the show. All right. The network has reported 28 fireballs over the United States. And oh my God, it's just like a big jangly mess. It looks like somebody's hair after they've pissed off the fairies. <laughs> it's crazy. 28 fireballs over the United States today. According to NASA's All Sky Cameras and the All Sky Fireball Network, we've had 20 sporadics, four Perseids, three Southern Delta Aquarids, and one Alpha Capricornid. That's, it's, everything is just totally, ah! <laughs> Uh, 12 is the big number coming out of Italy. 12 hertz frequency on the Schumann resonance scale from DisclosureNews.it. 12 is like nothing, guys. It was 7 yesterday. Like, are you kidding me with this crap? What? It's not like Italy has gone back down into the third dimension, right? But it's like, what is up with these super low numbers over there? I I don't know, but let's go to heartmath.org and see what happened two days ago. I don't know why they're not up to date on theirs, why they're two days behind, but they are. This is about a day and a half ago, Saturday, July 25th at the 2300 hour. California was at 116 hertz frequency. And if you're brand new to the show and you don't know about what I'm talking about, Schumann Resonances, okay? Uh, normally for like over 50 years, we were at 7.83 Hertz frequency. The fifth dimension starts at 40 Hertz frequency. California was at 116 Hertz frequency on Saturday at 2300. Hofuf Saudi Arabia is at zero. And like I said before, very much that could be that their equipment is not functional right now. I don't know, um, if they're really actually at zero, but usually when they come up off the mat, they go up to 200, 300. So maybe it is at zero. I don't know why. It's such wild fluctuations between places. I'm just reporting it and we could figure it out as we go along. Lithuania was at 170 hertz frequency. And, oh, this is a huge one. Alberta, Canada, they're the winner. <laughs> they're way up there. 326 hertz frequency on the Schumann resonance scale. That is enormous. 326 for Alberta, Canada. Northland, New Zealand was at 76 hertz frequency. And last but not least, Hulului, South Africa was at 116 hertz frequency. So there we go with that. All right. We got to get through this next thing really fast because we're running out of time. Ah! ACIM.org is the Foundation for Inner Peace website. This is Lesson 342 in A Course in Miracles. I let forgiveness rest upon all things, for thus forgiveness will be given me. Ah, yes. (laughs) I let forgiveness rest upon all things, for thus forgiveness will be given me. All right. I thank you, Father, for your plan to save me from the hell I made. It is not real. And you have given me the means to prove its unreality to me. The key is in my hand, and I have reached the door, beyond which lies the end of dreams. I stand before the gate of heaven, wondering if I should enter in and be at home. Let me not wait again today. Let me forgive all things, and let creation be as you would have it be, and as it is. Let me remember that I am your son and opening the door at last, forget illusions in the blazing light of truth as memory of you returns to me. Brother, forgive me now. I come to you to take you home with me. And as we go, the world goes on with us. The world goes with us on our way to God. I let forgiveness rest upon all things, for thus forgiveness will be given me. That's lesson 342 in A Course in Miracles. Ah, so perfect for what I said right before that, right? (laughs) Love how it always matches. You guys, we have a brand new book tonight. Woo! We're going to read The Kaibalion by Three Initiates. (laughs) They don't even give their names. 
but we're going to do that right after these messages. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening. It's that time of year, guys. Finally. OMG. I am up for not only one, but two People's Choice Podcast Awards this year. I had no idea. I just found out. Okay, the voting starts today, July 1st, and goes through the 31st of July. And I need you guys to nominate my podcast. This is how you do it. Go to podcastawards.com and you have to sign up in order to nominate me, in order to vote, and you have to go to the very first category at the top and it's the Adam Curry's People's Choice Podcast Award and I'm way down on the list because, you know, M, Metaphysical Soul Speak, the podcast and you just click that and then when you're done with that section you go to the religion and spirituality category and again cast your vote for metaphysical soul speak the podcast and then you have to go way at the bottom at the bottom part of the page and say save my nominations and that's it it's that simple it takes Less than two minutes, probably one minute if you have high-speed internet, of course. It's not that much. You can even do this on your phone. It's super, super simple. I voted for myself on my tablet. OMG. (laughs) So thank you for your continued support and listenership and voting for this show. Because by doing so, you're keeping the show alive And we're getting the word out so that other people can benefit from my expertise. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's high time you did. It is the absolute easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's absolutely free. Second of all, they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. You guys have known that I've been doing this for eight months using the anchor.fm app right on my cell phone and I have done it everywhere, right? I have recorded this in my living room, my bedroom, little cafes in Quito, Ecuador, all over Cuenca. It's so absolutely easy to make your podcast and editing is just a snap. Anchor also will distribute your podcast for you. And it took me about two and a half months to become syndicated. And now I'm available on Spotify, Apple podcast, and many more and so can you you can make money from your podcast also and there's no minimum requirement you get paid from your very first listener it is everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place so please if you are interested in making a podcast of your very own do not hesitate to start with anchor Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. All right, guys. So during the break, I was in the bathroom washing my hands and I looked up to the sky and I saw what I think is Saturn. You know, we've had all the planets lined up, which is really cool. But I looked up and I thought that was Saturn. It looks like a planet with a ring around it or maybe 
my eyesight is failing me, but <laughs> it's what it looked like. It might be Jupiter. Who knows? It's one of the bright planets right now. All the planets have been really close and really bright for some reason lately in the past couple weeks. So here it is. And I was looking over here and the, um, it's the weirdest thing happened. There's no, we have no flights here. We have no drones, nothing like that. I'm looking directly at what I think is Saturn and all of a sudden a bright red light pinpoint light. It's like it flashed me like boop. And then it was gone (laughs) and it was really unmistakable. So of course, like an idiot, I'm starting to wave out the window at what I'm perceiving to be maybe extraterrestrials looking at me. Hey, wave back. Why not? And I'm like, I hope my neighbors don't see me just like waving at the sky like a moron. But <laughs> just in case, I'm here, guys. Hi. <laughs> no, I mean, but really, you know, the Pentagon, they're saying that they have a recovered spacecraft that is not of this world. I feel like it's time to buckle our seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. This next few weeks, I wonder where the disclosure is going. I wonder what's going to happen. Where is it going? It's pretty cool. You think about it, it's pretty damn cool. And we have, you know, the Galactic Federation through many different people, including me. And all the members of the Galactic Federation that I'm channeling, I've been channeling the Lyrans, the Andromedans, Ashtar, you know, um... Michael Sherahan of Ashtar Command. He is called also Ashtar or Ashtar Sherahan. Um, the Pleiadians, basically. I mean, I'm channeling all these people, you know, Andromedans, Arcturians, and they're all part of this. And I just feel like any moment now, they're just going to be like, hi, we're here. Here's your replicators. Nobody's poor ever again. By the way, can we get that? We noticed over here there's something wrong with your environment. Can we just get that for you? Yeah, we'll fix that. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe it's my wishful thinking, guys, but I, I feel like a lot of things will be fixed and cleaned up and our big space brothers will help us. Please help us. But... Uh, even my son, who doesn't believe in hardly anything I believe in and tries not to believe I'm crazy when I bring this stuff up. <laughs> He's just like, I really want them to come, Mom. I just, I'm so please, please, please. I want to be so badly a part of that kind of lifestyle, you know, like, you know, being able to walk into a cantina with all the ETs from all over the universe, you know, would be so cool. Like on Star Wars, the cantina scene, the cantina scene, how am I even saying this right? But, you know, he's like the the whole Star Trek thing, you know, we're all the species of all the planets and we're all trying to get along and like, it's going to be so incredible, right? It's going to be so incredible. So anyway, I just, I can't believe I saw that red light right now. Just like, boop, there it is. All right, guys, here we go. We're going to get into a new book. First time I came across this book, my husband had it. I was married for 13 years. He died 10 years ago. And um, he had this weird, he had a lot of books. A lot of his books were 100 years old. <laughs> and he had this book, this little teeny tiny book called The Guy Lion, and it was blue, little blue cover, and very unassuming book. It was not much bigger than my hand, very tiny book. And I always thought it was strange. And I remember picking it up and I'd read a little bit here and there. Then I'd put it down. I don't believe I read the whole thing. And I don't believe I understood most of what I read anyway at the time. And I think I would understand it now. But I mean, this is a lot of years ago. But I'm going to read this to you guys. And hopefully it will be something of value to you. And here we go. The name of the book is The Kaiba Lion. I'm going to spell that for you. It's K Y B A L I O N. 
the Kaiba lion. It's one word, and it is a study of the hermetic philosophy of ancient Egypt and Greece. It is by three initiates. They don't give their names, just three initiates. And then they say, the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. Ooh, that's intriguing, right? This is copyrighted in 1912. Ooh, like the last book we read. Hmm, think there's a connection? Do, do, does anyone smell Swami Panchadasi's incense here? <laughs> it's possible one of the three initiates was William Walker Atkinson. But if there's three of them, I don't know. Who did he write with? Me, myself, and I? I don't know. We'll see. You know, honestly, if it looks, if it sounds like his style of writing, it's possible it's him. But it's also possible it's not. So we'll see as we get into the book, we can maybe guess who the three initiates are, but I don't know. <laughs> it was easier to guess who Gossip Girl was than this. I don't know, honestly. All right. The Yogi Publication Society, Masonic Temple, Chicago, Illinois, are the original publishers. The Masonic Temple are the original publishers from Chicago. Woo, woo. We're already getting into it. This is crazy. This is crazy. All right, so this book is dedicated to Hermes Trismegistus. All right, you might have heard of him. (laughs) Uh, Trismegistus means the thrice-born man. Hermes Trismegistus. You might have also heard of him as Thoth the Atlantean. Same person. So here we go. To Hermes Trismegistus, known by the ancient Egyptians as the great, great and master of masters. This little volume of hermetic teaching is reverently dedicated. So we're going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to read to you the introduction first. It's kind of long but I think it's worthwhile. Usually I skip the introductions, but I feel like in this one, we might want to hear it. We take great pleasure in presenting to the attention of students and investigators of the secret doctrines. This little work based upon the world old hermetic teachings. There has been so little written upon this subject, notwithstanding the countless references to the teachings capital T teachings in the many works upon occultism that the many earnest searchers after the arcane truths will doubtless welcome the appearance of this present volume. The purpose of this work is not the enunciation of any special philosophy or doctrine, but rather is to give the students a statement of the truth that will serve to reconcile the many bits of occult knowledge that they may have acquired, but which are apparently opposed to each other and which often serve to discourage and disgust the beginner in the study. Our intent is not to erect a new temple of knowledge, but rather to place in the hands of the student a master key with which he may open the many inner doors in the temple of mystery through the main portals he has already entered. There is no portion of the occult teachings possessed by the world which have been so closely guarded as the fragments of the hermetic teachings which have come down to us over the tens of centuries which have elapsed since the lifetime of its great founder, Hermes Trismegistus, the scribe of the gods, who dwelt in old Egypt in the days when the present race of men was in its infancy. Contemporary with Abraham, and if the legends be true, an instructor of that venerable sage, 
Ooh, he instructed Abraham. That's really strange, right? I mean, they're talking Abraham of the Bible, Abraham. So if legends be true, an instructor of that venerable sage, Hermes was and is the great central sun, S-U-N, of occultism, whose rays have served to illumine the countless teachings which have been promulgated since his time. All the fundamental and basic teachings embedded in the esoteric teachings of every race may be traced back to Hermes. Even the most ancient teachings of India undoubtedly have their roots in the original Hermetic teachings. From the land of the Ganges, many advanced occultists wandered to the land of Egypt and sat at the feet of the master. From him they obtained the master key, which explained and reconciled their divergent views, and thus the secret doctrine was firmly established. From other lands also came the learned ones, all of whom regarded Hermes as the master of masters. And his influence was so great that in spite of the many wanderings from the path on the part of the centuries of teachers in these different lands, there may still be found a certain basic resemblance and correspondence which underlies the many and often quite divergent theories entertained and taught by the occultists of these different lands today. The student of comparative religions will be able to perceive the influence of the hermetic teachings in every religion worthy of the name, now known to man, whether it be a dead religion in one or in full vigor in our own times. There's always certain correspondence in spite of the contradictory features, and the hermetic teachings act as the great reconciler. The life work of Hermes seems to have been in the direction of planting the great seed truth, which has grown and blossomed in so many strange forms, rather than to establish a school of philosophy, which would dominate the world's thought. But nevertheless, the original truths taught by him have been kept intact in their original purity by a few men each age, who refusing great numbers of half de- half developed students and followers followed the hermetic custom and reserved their truth for the few who were ready to comprehend and master it from lip to ear the truth has been handed down among the few there have always been a few initiate initiates initiates <laughs> in each generation in the various lands of earth who kept alive the sacred flame of the hermetic teachings. And such have always been willing to use their lamps to relight the lesser lamps of the outside world when the light of truth grew dim and clouded by reason of neglect when the wicks became clogged with foreign matter. There were always a few to tend faithfully the altar of the truth upon which was kept all alight the perpetual lamp of wisdom. These men devoted their lives to the labor of love, which the poet has so well stated in his lines. Oh, let not the flame die out. Cherished age after age in its dark cavern, in its holy temples cherished, fed by pure ministers of love, let not the flame die out. These men have never sought popular approval nor numbers of followers. They are indifferent to these things, for they know how few they there are in each generation who are ready for the truth, or who would recognize it if it were presented to them. They reserve the strong meat for men, while others furnish the milk for babes. They reserve their pearls of wisdom for the few elect who recognize their value and who wear them in their crowns. 
instead of casting them before the materialistic vulgar swine who would trample them in the mud and mix them with their disgusting mental food. But still, these men have never forgotten or overlooked the original teachings of Hermes regarding the passing on of the words of truth to those ready to receive it. While teaching is stated in the Kaibalayan as follows, Where fall the footsteps of the master, the ears of those ready for his teaching open wide. And again, When the ears of the student are ready to hear, then cometh the lips to fill them with wisdom. But their customary attitude has always been strictly in accordance with the other hermetic aphorism also in the Kaivalayan. The lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. There are those who have criticized this attitude of the hermeticists. I mean, I'm sorry, hermetists. And who have claimed that they did not manifest the proper spirit in the policy of seclusion and reticence. But a moment's glance back over the pages of history will show the wisdom of the masters who knew the folly of attempting to teach the world that which it was neither ready nor willing to receive. The hermetists have never sought to be martyrs and have instead sat silently aside with a pitying smile on their closed lips while the heathen raged noisily about them in their customary amusement of putting to death and torture the honest but misguided enthusiasts who imagined that they could force upon a race of barbarians the truth capable of being understood only by the elect who had advanced along the path. And the spirit of persecution has not as yet died out in the land. There are certain hermetic teachings which, if publicly promulgated, would bring down upon the teachers a great cry of scorn and revilement from the multitude, who would again raise the cry of crucify crucify in this little work we have endeavored to give you an idea of the fundamental teachings of the Kaibalion striving to give you the working principles leaving you to apply them yourselves rather than attempting to work out the teaching in detail if you are a true student you will be able to work out and apply these principles If not, then you must develop yourself into one, for otherwise the hermetic teachings will be as words, words, words to you. The three initiates. All right, well, before we get into the book now, that was, that was the, uh, that was the introduction. So I think it's time to read this book out loud to the world because it might just sound like words, words, words to you. And if it does, but you're still interested, maybe this is your initiation. And maybe if you do get it, that's because you've spiritually advanced enough to get it. And maybe you'll get some of it, not others, you know, other parts it's all going to come to you. So I think let's just push through it over the next, you know, two or three or four weeks, however long it takes to read this book, which is not very big. I think it's going to, uh, open some doors and it's going to clarify some things. So I am going to continue forward. I remember reading that thinking, you know, years ago that this no one can read this book. This is too, the stuff is sacred. And now we've all been going through the ascension path. We're in the fifth dimension and we're all seeking and seeking and seeking the knowledge. We're thirsty. I'm hoping this book can quench some of that thirst. So here we go. Chapter one, the hermetic philosophy. 
The lips of wisdom are closed, except to the ears of understanding, the Kybalion. So here we go. From old Egypt have come the fundamental esoteric and occult teachings, which have so strongly influenced the philosophies of all women. Do we not just read this? Like, seriously, is, is this, did they just like repeat themselves? You know, it's possible. I'm like, did, I, I just feel like I read this. All right, I'm going to read that again, but seriously, I'm not tripping. It just, it just like, it's like repeating itself a little bit there. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. All right. It's like, did I not just read that exact sentence? Okay, this is chapter one. All right. From old Egypt have come the fundamental esoteric and occult teachings, which have so strongly influenced the philosophies of all races, nations, and peoples. For several thousand years, Egypt, the home of the pyramids and the Sphinx, was the birthplace of the hidden wisdom and mystic teachings. From her secret doctrine, all nations have borrowed India, Persia, Chaldea, Medea, China, Japan, Assyria, ancient Greece, and Rome, and other ancient countries partook liberally at the Feast of Knowledge, which the Hierophants and masters of the land of Isis so freely provided for those who came prepared to partake of the great store of mystic and occult lore which the masterminds of that ancient land had gathered together. In ancient Egypt dwelt the great adepts and masters who have never been surpassed and who seldom have been equaled during the centuries that have taken their processional flight since the days of the great Hermes. In Egypt was located the great lodge of lodges of the mystics. At the doors of her temples entered the neophytes who afterward as hierophants, adepts, and masters traveled to the four corners of the earth, carrying with them the precious knowledge which they were ready, anxious, and willing to pass on to those who are ready to receive the same. All students of the occult recognize the debt that they owe to these venerable masters of the ancient land. But among these great masters of ancient Egypt, there once dwelt one of whom masters hailed as the master of masters. This man, if man indeed he was, dwelt in Egypt in the earliest days. He was known as Hermes Trismegistus. He was the father of the occult wisdom, the founder of astrology, the discoverer of alchemy. The details of his life story are lost to history. Owing to the lapse of the years, Though several of the ancient countries disputed with each other in their claims to the honor of having furnished his birthplace. And this thousands of years ago. The date of his sojourn in Egypt is that his last incarnation on the planet is not now known, but it has been fixed at the early days of the oldest dynasties of Egypt long before the days of Moses. The best authorities regard him as a contemporary of Abraham, and some of the Jewish traditions go so far as to claim that Abraham acquired a portion of his mystic knowledge from Hermes himself. As the years rolled by after his passing from this plane of life, tradition recording that he lived 300 years in the flesh, The Egyptians deified Hermes and made him one of their gods under the name of Thoth. Years after the people of ancient Greece 
also made him one of their many gods, calling him Hermes, the god of wisdom. The Egyptians revered his memory for many centuries, yes, tens of centuries, calling him the scribe of the gods and bestowing upon him distinctively his ancient title, Trismegistus, which means the thrice great, the great great, the greatest great, etc. In all the ancient lands, the name of Hermes Trismegistus was revered, the name being synonymous with the fount of wisdom. Even to this day, we use the term hermetic in the sense of secret, sealed so that nothing can escape, etc. And this by reason of the fact that the followers of Hermes always observed the principle of secrecy in their teachings. They did not believe in casting pearls before swine, but rather held to the teaching milk for babes, meat for strong men, both of which maxims are familiar to readers of the Christian scriptures, but both of which have been used by the Egyptians for centuries before the Christian era. And this policy of careful dissemination of truth has already characterized the Hermetics, even unto the present day. The Hermetic teachings are to be found in all lands, among all religions, but never identified with any particular country, nor with any particular religious sect. This because of the warning of the ancient teachers allowing against allowing the secret doctrine to become crystallized into a creed. The wisdom of this caution is apparent to all students of history. The ancient occultism of India and Persia degenerated and was largely lost owing to the fact that the teachers became priests and so mixed theology with philosophy. The result being that the occultism of India and Persia has been gradually lost amidst the mass of religious superstition, cults, creeds, and gods. So it was with ancient Greece and Rome. So it was with the hermetic teachings of the Gnostics and early Christians, which were lost at the time of Constantine, whose iron hand smothered philosophy with the blanket of theology, losing to the Christian church that which was its very essence and spirit, and causing it to grope throughout several centuries before it found its way back to its ancient faith, the indications apparent to all careful observers in this 20th century being that the church is now struggling to get back to its ancient mystic teachings. But there were always a few faithful souls who kept alive the flame, tending it carefully, not allowing its light to become extinguished. And thanks to these staunch hearts and fearless minds, we have the truth still with us, but it is not found in books to any great extent. It has been passed along from master to student, from initiate to hierophant, from lip to ear. When it was written down at all, its meaning was veiled in terms the key could read it all right. I'm sorry, I just skipped a line. Read that again. When it was written down at all, its meaning was veiled in terms of alchemy and astrology so that only those possessing the key could read it aright. Cool. This was made necessary in order to avoid the persecutions of the theologians of the Middle Ages who fought the secret doctrine with fire and sword, stake, gibbet, and cross. Even to this day, there will be found few reliable books on the Hermetic philosophy, although there are countless references to it in many books written on various phases of occultism. And yet, the Hermetic philosophy is the only master key which will open all the doors of the occult teachings. 
checking the time here. Wow, we're already halfway through. Oh no. All right. In the early days, there was a compilation of certain basic hermetic doctrines passed on from teacher to student, which was known as the Kaibalion. The exact significance and meaning of the term having been lost for several centuries. This teaching, however, is more to known. I'm sorry. I'm just, you guys, I feel like we are right now in this very moment being hit by that solar flare. My body is starting to shake and I'm starting to feel weak again. It's just this energy. I'm feeling overwhelmed and a little bit tired and sleepy. So I'm going to push through my best that I can possibly do. Um, hopefully I could keep it together before this, uh, solar wind comes, uh, more. All right. I just took off my glasses and forgot that I was using them. (laughs) Habits. Anyway. So. This teaching, the Kaibalion, however, is known to many to whom it has descended from mouth to ear and on and on throughout the centuries. Its precepts have never been written down or printed as far as we know. It was merely a collection of maxims, axioms, and precepts, which were non-understandable to outsiders, but which were readily understood by students. After the axioms, maxims, and precepts had been explained and exemplified by the hermetic initiates to their neophytes. These teachings are... Uh, I'm sorry, these teachings really constituted the basic principles of the art of hermetic alchemy, which contrary to general belief dealt with the mastery of mental forces rather than material elements, the transmutation of one kind of mental vibrations into others, instead of the changing of one kind of metal into another. The legends of the philosopher's stone, which would turn base metal into gold, was an allegory relating to hermetic hermetic philosophy readily understood by all students of true hermetism. I'm sorry, hermeticism. See, now that's where the hermeticist, that's where that word comes from, hermeticism. All right. In this little book of which this is the first lesson, we invite our students to examine into the hermetic teachings as set forth in the Kaivalayan. And as explained by ourselves, humble students of the teachings, who, while bearing the title of initiates, are still students at at the feet of Hermes, the master. We herein give you many of the maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kaivalayan, accompanied by explanations and illustrations, which we deem likely to render the teachings more easily comprehended by the modern student, particularly as the original text is purposely veiled in obscure terms. The or- original maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kaibalion are printed herein in italics, the proper credit being given. Our own work is printed in the regular way in the body of the work. We trust that the many students to whom we now offer this little work will derive as much benefit from the study of its pages as have the many who have gone on before, treading the same path to mastery throughout the centuries that have passed since the times of Hermes Trismegistus, the master of masters, the great, great. In the words of the Kaibalion, where fall the footsteps of the master, the ears of those ready for his teaching open wide, the Kaibalion. When the ears of the student are ready to hear, then cometh the lips to fill them with wisdom, the Kaibalion. So that according to the teachings, the passage of this book to those ready for the instruction will attract the attention of such as are prepared to receive the teaching. And likewise, when the pupil is ready to receive the truth, 
then will this little book come to him or her such is the law the hermetic principle of cause and effect in its aspect of the law of attraction will bring lips and ear together pupil and book in company so mote it be so all right here we go oh i'm over here trying to channel the energy i'm feeling so that i don't fall asleep <laughs> cuz it just it, it makes me knock it just knocks me out all this space weather coming our way with the magnetosphere cracked open like this but that's okay we're all opening up to these truths and so i'm going to push on here i took a little bit of a break and for like a couple minutes went and read some email and And then I did a 5 minute meditation just like woo trying to push some of this energy through get some more mental clarity so I don't fall asleep. Woo, this is some wild energy. I hope you guys um are enjoying it. Basking in the glow of the cosmic radiation. <laughs> We will be radiant beings at the end of this. Okay, chapter 2. The seven hermetic principles. I said 2 and looked up and it's 2:22 a.m. here. Okay, well, it's going to be about 30 minutes late in California when I publish this. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, so the seven hermetic principles. The principles of truth are seven. He who knows these understandingly possesses the magic key before whose touch all the doors of the temple fly open. the kabbalion the seven hermetic principles upon which the entire hermetic philosophy is based are as follows number 1 the principle of mentalism number 2 the principle of correspondence number 3 the principle of vibration number 4 the principle of polarity number 5 the principle of rhythm number 6 the principle of cause and effect number 7 the principle of gender these seven principles will be discussed and explained as we proceed with these lessons a short explanation on each however may as well be given at this point number 1 the principle of mentalism the all is mind the universe is mental the kabbalion This principle embodies the truth that all is mind. It explains that the all which is the substantial reality underlying all the outward manifestations and appearances which we know under the terms of the material universe, the phenomena of life, matter, energy, and in short all that is apparent to our material senses is spirit. which in itself is unknowable and undefinable but which may be considered and thought of as an universal infinite living mind it also explains that all the phenomena all the phenomenal world or universe is simply a mental creation of the all subject to laws of created things and that the universe as a whole and in its parts or units has its existence in the mind of the all in which mind we live and move and have our being this principle by establishing the mental nature of the universe easily explains all of the varied mental and psychic phenomena that occupy such a large portion of the public attention and which without such explanation are non-understandable and defy scientific treatment an understanding of this great hermetic principle of mentalism enables the individual to readily grasp the laws of the mental universe and to apply the same to his well-being and advancement 
The hermetic student is enabled to apply intelligently the great mental laws instead of using them in a haphazard manner. With the master key in his possession, the student may unlock the many doors of the mental and psychic temple of knowledge and enter the same freely and intelligently. This principle explains the true nature of energy, power, and matter, and why and how all these are subordinate to the mastery of mind. One of the old hermetic masters wrote long ages ago, he who grasps the truth of the mental nature of the universe is well advanced on the path to mastery. And these words are as true today as at the time they were first written. Without this master key, mastery is impossible. And the student blocks in vain at the many doors of the temple. Number two, the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. The Kaivalion. This principle embodies the truth that there is always a correspondence between the laws and phenomena of various planes of being and life. The old hermetic axiom ran in these words, as above, so below, as below, so above. And the grasping of this paradox gives one the means of solving many a dark paradox and hid, hidden secret of nature. There are planes beyond our knowing, but when we apply the principle of correspondence to them, we are able to understand much that would otherwise be unknowable to us. This principle is of universal application and manifestation on the various planes of the material, mental, and spiritual universe. It is an universal law. The ancient Hermetist, Hermetists considered the prince, this principle as one of the most important mental instruments by which man was able to pry aside the obstacles which hid from view the unknown. Its use even tore aside the veil of Isis to the extent that a glimpse of the face of the goddess might be caught. Just as a knowledge of the principles of geometry enables man to measure distant suns and their movements while seated in his observatory, so a knowledge of the principle of correspondence enables man to see I'm sorry enables man to reason intelligently from the known to the unknown studying the monad he understands the archangel number three the principle of vibration nothing rests everything moves everything vibrates the Kabbalion. This principle embodies the truth that everything is in motion. Everything vibrates. Nothing is at rest. Facts which modern science endorses and which each new scientific discovery tends to verify. And yet, this hermetic principle was enunciated thousands of years ago by the masters of ancient Egypt. This principle explains that the differences between different manifestations of matter, energy, mind, and even spirit result largely from the varying rates of vibration. From the all, which is pure spirit, down to the grossest form of matter, all is in vibration. The higher the vibration, the higher the position in the scale. The vibration of spirit is at such an infinite rate of intensity and rapidity that it is practically at rest, just as a rapidly moving wheel seems to be motionless. 
And at the other end of the scale, there are gross forms of matter whose vibrations are so low as to seem at rest. Between these poles, there are millions upon millions of varying degrees of vibration from corpuscles and electron atom and molecule to worlds and universes everything is in vibratory motion this is also true on the planes of energy and force which are but varying degrees of vibration and also on the mental planes whose states depend upon vibrations and even to the spiritual planes An understanding of this principle with the appropriate formulas enables hermetic students to control their own mental vibrations as well as those of others. The masters also supply this principle to the conquering of natural phenomena in various ways. He who understands the principle of vibration has grasped grasped the scepter of power says one of the old writers. I didn't say that. They they said that. Okay. Whew. Stuff is like really, really deep. You might want to listen to this episode a couple times, or at least the second half, so we can all get this, right? Okay. Number four, the principle of polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites and identical. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet. All truths are but half truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. The Kaibalion. Wow, okay. This principle embodies the truth that everything is dual. Everything has two poles. Everything has its pair of opposites, all of which were old hermetic axioms. It explains the old paradoxes that have perplexed so many, which have been stated as follows. Thesis and antithesis are identical in nature, but different in degree. Opposites are the same, differing only in degree. The pairs of opposites may be reconciled. Extremes meet. Everything is and isn't at the same time. Everything is and isn't at the same time. I want to say it twice, just so you get it. All truths are but half-truths. Wow. Okay. All truths are but half truths. Every truth is half false. There are two sides to everything. Etc. 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 It explains that in every day there are two poles or opposite aspects, and that opposites are really only two extremes of the same thing, with many varying degrees between them. To illustrate heat and cold although opposites are really the same thing the difference is consisting merely of degrees of the same thing look at your thermometer and see if you could discover where heat terminates and cold begins there's no such thing as absolute heat or absolute cold the two terms heat and cold simply indicate varying degrees of the same thing And that same thing, which manifests as heat and cold, is merely a form, variety, and rate of vibration. So heat and cold are simply the two poles out of that which we call heat. And the phenomena attendant thereupon are manifestations of the principle of polarity. The same principle manifests in the case of light and darkness, which are the same thing. The difference consisting of varying degrees between the two poles of the phenomena. Where does darkness leave off and light begin? What is the difference between large and small? 
between hard and soft, between black and white, between sharp and dull, between noise and quiet, between high and low, between positive and negative. The principle of polarity explains these paradoxes and no other principle can supersede it. The same principle operates on the mental plane. Let us take a radical ex- extreme example, that of love and hate. Two mental states apparently totally different. And yet there are degrees of hate and degrees of love. Wow, all right. And a middle point in which we must I'm sorry, in the middle point in which we use the terms like or dislike, which shade into each other so gradually that sometimes we are at a loss to know whether we like or dislike, or neither. And all are simply degrees of the same thing, as you will see if the will but think a moment. And more than this, and considered of more importance by the hermetists, it is possible to change the vibrations of hate to the vibrations of love in one's own mind and in the minds of others. Many of you who read these lines have had personal experiences of the involuntary rapid transition from love to hate and the reverse in your own case and that of others. And you will therefore realize the possibility of this being accomplished by the use of the will, by means of hermetic formulas. Good and evil are but the poles of the same thing. And the hermetist understands the art of transmuting evil into good by means of an application of the principle of polarity. In short, the art of polarization becomes a phase of mental alchemy known and practiced by the ancient and modern hermetic masters. An understanding of the principle will enable one to change his own polarity as well as that of others if he will devote the time and study necessary to master the art. I'm going to see where we're at here. Wow, we have like less than six minutes. Crazy. The principle of rhythm, number five. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. The Kybalion. Wow, this is... Really deep, man. Okay. Hopefully you guys are getting it. If you're not, you might want to listen a couple times. You'll get it. This principle embodies the truth that in everything there is manifested a measured motion to and fro, a flow, an inflow, a swing backward and forward, a pendulum like movement, a tide like ebb and flow, a high tide and low tide between the two poles which exist in accordance with the principle of polarity described a moment ago. There's always an action and reaction, advance and retreat, a rising and sinking. This is in the affairs of the universe, suns, worlds, men, animals, mind, energy and matter. This law is manifest in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, in the life of all things, and finally, in the mental states of man, and it is with this latter that the hermetists find the understanding of the principle most important. The hermetists have grasped this principle, finding its universal application, and have also discovered certain means to overcome its effects in themselves by the use of appropriate formulas and methods. They apply the mental law of neutralization. They cannot annul the principle or cause it to cease its operation. 
but they have learned how to escape its effects upon themselves to a certain degree, depending on the mastery of the principle. They have learned how to use it instead of being used by it. In this and similar methods consists the art of the hermet hermetists. The master of hermetics polarizes himself at the point at which he desires to rest and then neutralizes the rhythmic swing of the pendulum, which would tend to carry him to the other pole. All individuals who have attained any degree of self mastery do this to a certain degree, more or less unconsciously, but the master does this consciously and by the use of his will and attains a degree of poise and mental firmness. Also impossible of belief on the part of the masses who are swung backward and forward like a pendulum. This principle and that of polarity have been closely studied by the hermetists and the methods of counteracting, neutralizing and using them form an important part of the hermetic mental alchemy. Well, we're going to stop there. We'll pick it up next week on the principle of cause and effect. But boy, we're like right down to the wire. <laughs> Woo we, well, we did it. We got into it. This is really deep, deep metaphysics guys. I hope you're enjoying the show. I hope you enjoy all the shows and I hope you enjoyed this episode in particular. Um, I'm, well, <laughs> all right, there we go. Lots of stuff to think about. Well, that's it. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with all unique and original programming, just like always. Remember that this is the last week to get your vote in for me to nominate Metaphysical Soul Speak, the podcast, for the People's Choice Awards. So if you haven't done that, please, please, please go vote for me in two categories. On the description, the word description of this uh, very episode, this podcast, is all the instructions. So there you go. Woohoo. Yes. Yeah, my mind is swimming. Uh, I had several dreams in the past couple weeks that I was reading this book. So I'm like reading it to you guys going, I just read this. I just freaking read this. And then at the last paragraph that I just read to you guys, I was reading this going, I just freaking read this like in my dream, like a couple days ago. No wonder I feel so exhausted when I wake up. I am on the other side in another dimension, studying this stuff diligently. <clears throat> it just makes sense now. Wow. I'm blown away. I'm going to have to think on this for a minute. All right. Well, I love you guys. And I want to thank you for having your, um, confidence in me and for supporting the show and, and me and everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you so much. Thank you for being here and being a part of my life and a part of my Ascension journey as I am a part of yours. That's it. That's it for tonight. I'm signing off with peace and joy and the high vibes of the Holy fifth dimension guys until next time. Peace. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.